Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you for uh, being here. I'm Guillaume Laforge, I'm the group project lead, and I work for Pivotal. Pivotal, that's uh, this kind of big box uh, with all those cool uh, pieces of software inside, so Groovy, Grails, um, Tomcat, and so on, Redis. So that's my company. Thank you. And let's start by reviewing what we did with Groovy 2.2. Then we'll move on to uh, uh, Groovy 2.3, which is the release we'll be uh, making uh, in, a, in a month or so. And then we'll talk a little bit about Groovy 3 and beyond what we're going to do there. So, first thing, implicit closure coercion. So when you have uh, something like a, a predicate here, uh, with a test method, which tests something, whether it's true or false, uh, in terms of uh, return type. Let's say you have a, a filter, which is a bit like our find all, but uh, for the purpose of that example, I'm just calling find all, uh, which takes a list and then uh, a predicate. And then, okay, list, find all, and I test for each and every value of my list. So the, the usual style here, uh, Groovy style pre uh, Groovy 2.2 was that uh, if you wanted to use a closure instead of cr you know creating a, an anonymous in our class or uh, or something like that, uh, you had to uh, use as to uh, transform that closure into the predicate. Okay, but with uh, I think I have got some visual cues. Uh, so it's a bit verbose, and we would have liked uh, to be able to do it like that, like the Java 8 uh, style, which uh, somehow does that uh, lambda coercion to coerce into the uh, functional interfaces. Uh, so that's what, that's what we did in Groovy uh, 2.2. And also the fact uh, which is a usual syntax trick in, in Groovy, uh, when the closure is the last parameter of a function, of a method, you can put the closure outside, so it looks uh, more like, a, you know, your own control structure, so, or a bit like a final, basically. So that's implicit co closure coercion compared to the Java 8 lambda. So we managed to have something which is uh, uh, even slightly shorter than the, the Java equivalent. And a difference also with uh, Java 8 is that uh, with Java it only works with functional interfaces. So even if you have a, an abstract class with one abstract method, uh, it wouldn't work. It really has to uh, be with interfaces, but with Groovy we also made it work uh, with uh, abstract classes. Some new AST transformations. <clears throat> so we have uh, memoized. So we had uh, a memoize method on closures already, but we didn't have anything for methods. So we added memoized, so reusing the infrastructure, the, the cache system, and so on. Uh, from the stuff we did for closures, we reused that. And we have an AST transformation triggered by this uh, at memoized annotation. Uh, which allows to do that for uh, methods as well. So here, let's say we have a very expensive operation. So for adding two numbers uh, with a slip one second. Uh, so each time I want to add those two numbers, it's going to take uh, one second. So the first time you're going to actually call that method with uh, one and two, it's going to take one second. But the second time, uh, now I think I've got some bubbles. Um, the second time, because the value, uh, the outcome of the method is put into cache, uh, you get the result instantaneously. So it, it's important as well to remember that uh, you memoize uh, side effect three uh, methods, uh, which uh, return always the same result for the same set of values, of input values. Because otherwise, if you memoize something, uh, that might change uh, when the parameters are uh, the same, uh, that's not necessarily a good idea. So that's memoized. 
And uh, yeah, a, a little example with uh, Fibonacci, for example. So that's uh, yeah, the usual Fibonacci. If you call Fib, Fib 40, it's going to take, uh, uh, without at memoized, it would take something like uh, one minute or something like that. I don't remember. But if you use the at memoized, it will return much more uh, quickly. And um, what's interesting uh, in, in that specific example is that with the, the recursive uh, nature of the function, you're going to uh, call several times, and I've got a, a little graphic afterwards. You, you're actually going to call several times uh, Fib with the same uh, value. So, for example, if you want to calculate Fibonacci of 7, you're going to have to calculate 5 Fibonacci 5 plus Fibonacci 6. But to calculate 5, you have to calculate 3 and 4, and 1 and 2. So you calculate 1, you calculate 2. You've got the result for Fibonacci 3. Now you have to go back down to Fibonacci 4. And then again Fibonacci 2. But it's actually now in the cache because we calculated it uh, right here. Then uh, for Fibonacci 3, again, it's in the cache because we already calculated it. Fibonacci 6, 4 is in the cache, 5 is in the cache. So you don't even have to go further down. Just like we have uh, at log for various uh, logging solutions, commons logging, uh, Java util logging, etc. We also added another logger with uh, log for J2. So just annotate with uh, at log for, for J2. And then you can uh, log uh, anything because it creates a, uh, a log uh, field uh, in your class. <coughs> So now another thing, so it's not, see, it's still related to ST transformations. It's uh, an improvement on uh, add delegate. Let's say you're creating a, an event class, uh, and you want to delegate uh, to a start date and an end date. But uh, it's delegating to the same uh, type. Uh, so you might want to uh, use uh, the before of let's say uh, start and the after of end so that you can do so first of all let's create a date let's create uh, next week we create a new groovy conference it starts next week and ends next week plus two days and because of the delegation uh, you can say even before next week next week plus one uh, because it starts before the second day of the conference, obviously, etc. So you've got all those asserts. And uh, so here for the start, we exclude it after because we want end uh, to take care of the after and start to take care of the before. So that's how we manage to uh, uh, be able to, to do a before or after like the, the, the following asserts. Okay, I'm not sure my explanation is very clear, but. Uh, the evening yesterday was quite tough, so I'm <laughs> not sure. Uh, and I still have a cold, so I have some difficulties to speak <clears throat> and uh, recover all my brain cells somehow. But it's, uh, it's nice to be able to somehow make, make your event uh, class uh, uh, reply to the usual date method, so after, before, etc. That's quite handy. Yeah. So I think usually it's uh, the first one wins, and that's uh, usually the path we take when when there's such a such a problem. So normally it would be uh, uh, all the other methods would be uh, called on start. Okay. Yeah. Is, uh, the answer is, uh, in, an include, so just yeah. You also have include as well. It's not just uh, excludes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. And yeah, delegate to the end. OK. So we have some uh, new stuff, or especially for things like when you uh, embed Groovy in, a, in an application, for instance. Um, scripts can have a, a, a base script class. By default, it's Groovy length script, but you can provide your own base script class. 
and uh, because you might want to provide common methods uh, for all your scripts that you're going to evaluate. So let's have a look at this one. So I'm going to create uh, my own uh, base script class. So I'm extending script and I add a property, uh, meaning of life. And then uh, instead of uh, having to specify a new groovy shell, new compiler configuration, and the compiler configuration, you say set base uh, script class. Uh, you can annotate um, here uh, inside your script, uh, base script, uh, the, the name doesn't matter anyway, uh, base script, and you specify the, the class that you want to be used as base uh, script class. And then inside, uh, well, the, the rest of uh, your script, uh, you have actually access to meaning of life or all the methods, etc., that you might have provided inside your custom base script class. And there are also some uh, refinements uh, coming up, but I'm not mentioning them towards. OK. Uh, so this one uh, is interesting. And it's been uh, contributed by uh, Koshuke, the guy behind the Jenkins uh, continuous integration platform. Uh, so there's a, a, a Groovy integration inside the Jenkins, so you can customize Jenkins with your own uh, um, build tasks or whatever it's called. Uh, and he wanted to be able to uh, delegate all assignments, method calls, etc., to some custom uh, class. So in his script, he wants to be able to write that, and somehow he wants everything, name and say hi, to be delegated to a custom class, an, an instance of uh, that class. And he created uh, the, the delegating script, so it's, a, it's a, a base script class, which extends Groovy Lang script. So this is the usual way, uh, instead of using at uh, base script uh, transformation. So you, you say compiler configuration, you say the script base class to be that delegating script. You pass that configuration to the Groovy shell. Uh, you parse your file. You can then set the, the delegate, it's a method uh, on, on, on script, uh, uh, and the, on, the, yeah, on, the, on, on the delegating script uh, class. And then uh, you pass the instance of your custom class, and all the calls, when you run uh, the script, all the calls uh, will be delegated uh, to your P instance, and when you call p.name, it's going to have uh, Guillaume inside, because that's what I did here by saying name equals Guillaume. Okay? So, uh, the bubbles. so it's a new uh, handy way, uh, so you don't have to do the the logic yourself by uh, implementing new book method, get property, all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a nice shortcut for integration purpose. Uh, yeah, for oh, this one, I'm going to go fast on that one. Delegates to. Uh, what's interesting with delegates to, for those who don't know, that's uh, here to help IDs or the static uh, type checking and the static compiler. Uh, well, static type checking, especially, uh, to know uh, that when, when you create, uh, so it's, don't look at the example because uh, just listen to my voice. Uh, so it instructs uh, tools and IDEs and, and compilers uh, to say, okay, uh, when uh, I have, uh, I should have a better example than that, but. Uh, so here you have a, I'm going to explain with that example, but uh, bear with me, I should have showed a, a simpler example first and explain that one afterwards. So let's say you have a map, a method which takes uh, a list, and the second argument is a closure. So that what you, that's what you're seeing here. So I've, I've got map, uh, uh, my custom uh, list uh, class, and then the closure, okay? And what I want to say is that I want uh, to say that calls inside that closure are actually delegated 
on uh, the argument which is passed to the map uh, method. But here it's a little bit different because we want to be able to uh, delegate calls to what's inside uh, the components of uh, the, the list, my custom list. So I, I want to say, and by using delegates to target and uh, generic type index, I want to say, okay, I want to delegate to uppercase to the, the string elements of my custom list. So it indicates zero because that the first uh, type token here, that's T, but we're not allowed to use T uh, because of some JVM limitations. And that way you are able to, if you use uh, static type checking or uh, your ID will be able to, for example, autocomplete to uppercase because it knows that it's going to be, uh, to uppercase is going to be called on the elements of that custom list. Okay, so it's a bit for advanced API writers who want to help with uh, things like ID support and type checking. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Speaking of type checking, uh, so who's heard of uh, type checking extensions already? Yeah, just a handful, so not, not that many. Uh, so since GUI 2, uh, we have a static type checker and static compiler, which is the static type checker. But what's interesting with that uh, static type checker is that you can even customize it. You can hook into the static type checking process and add your own checks uh, that you want. So uh, if you want to uh, statically type check a custom DSL, a custom domain-specific language, you can do that thanks to uh, type checking extensions. And uh, before uh, type checking extensions, we're working with scripts uh, in a textual uh, form, uh, but now it also works when your uh, type checking extension is pre-compiled. So you can just say, okay, extensions, I'm going to use that uh, extension, pre-compiled extension by using the, the fully qualified name uh, inside a, a string. Up, yeah, statically type. Checked DSL code. And uh, what's interesting is that, uh, for example, you may have a, a very highly dynamic uh, uh, DSL and you can even statically type check it. That's uh, pretty powerful. Anyway. And there are some new events. Uh, so when the, the static type checker encounters something it doesn't understand, uh, for example, uh, <coughs> it notices a, a method doesn't exist or it didn't find a, a method, uh, it's going to, uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, somehow an event-based API, if you will. And you implement a script with uh, those uh, events implementing, passing a closure to the, the events that are triggered by the static type checking API. And uh, here we have a new one, a new uh, event, which is incompatible return time. So if you have, uh, I don't know if I have a, an example. No, yeah, never mind. So uh, if in a method uh, string foo and you return no more. I'm going to take a, another example than string. Uh, let's say uh, uh, foo, uh, a method uh, foo which returns, uh, let's say, uh, a list. And uh, inside your method, at the, the very end, you return uh, a Boolean or uh, an integer. Uh, it's not compatible. That's not a compatible uh, return type, right? So in that case, the compiler uh, will complain because it's going to tell you hey, that's uh, an incompatible uh, return type return type compared to the one you have declared in the signature of your method. But if you use a, a custom type checking extension, you can actually uh, fetch and receive that uh, event. And here in my example, uh, I say that, okay, if the return type which is inferred by the, uh, the static type checking uh, is uh, of type string, I'm going to say, okay, it's normal. Perhaps my DSL is going to do the transformation 
uh, into uh, the other correct return type of the method uh, or a next transformation, etc. So that's how you can uh, do your own type checking for your DSLs. Uh, well, one of the, of the things you can do. We also have another uh, event with ambiguous methods. Uh, in the case where uh, you have uh, methods with, uh, uh, well, to, uh, you know, sometimes you receive uh, by the compiler, it's going to tell you, I don't know which uh, method you really want to call, is it that one or the other one? <coughs> and uh, that's also an event which is triggered by the static type checker. So you can intercept that event and do something about it. So here, uh, we say that uh, blah, blah, blah. So the, 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 the arguments which are uh, passed here, that's the list of methods which are possible candidates. And um, if I find one of uh, the, the methods with uh, one parameters, which is uh, of type integer, uh, it's going to be OK, for example. Um, the last one, uh, which was actually uh, requir required by the, the Grails team. So it's not an event, but it's a, a method that you can call uh, inside uh, your custom type checking extension. Uh, for example, if uh, uh, a method is not found, a property is not found, etc., you can say, okay, make this call actually a dynamic call. And it means that, especially when you use uh, the, the static compiler, that uh, you can say that uh, a method is actually statically compiled, but for certain things, like a method uh, not found, I'm going to make a dynamic call. So it's a, it's a bit like mixing uh, statically compiled code and uh, dy dynamic code. So you can do that by using uh, make dynamic. Okay, make dynamic, make dynamic, etc. So use with care because uh, when you do that, when you mix uh, static compilation and uh, normal dynamic invocation, uh, you might have you know, some surprises. Uh, that's why initially we, uh, it's not on by default, you have to activate that yourself with a custom type checking extension because otherwise uh, it's a bit uh, uh, tricky for the cases where actually uh, this one method uh, that wasn't actually found, uh, it's because there was a typo, it's not because it's going to be handled dynamically. So use with care. So we have some uh, Groovy Development Kit improvements. And I took some uh, examples also uh, from the blog from uh, Mr. Haki. Uh, this one, you can uh, do a subtraction of a string and a regular expression. So let's say you want to remove uh, all the words uh, starting with uh, gr. <laughs> so if there was, uh, if there were a uh, greech inside, hello greech, uh, uh, hello groovy world, I'm at greech, at the greech conference, uh, it would uh, remove uh, groovy and uh, greech. Hello world, I'm uh, at the conference. A string, a pattern, and uh, you see that the match string is removed. Uh, yeah, lots of uh, methods have been added to uh, iterables, uh, to iterator, uh, or yeah, for iterables, and there are some new ones for uh, iterators, I think. Uh, so <coughs> anything that is uh, iterable and returns an iterator. So we, we added the usual GDK methods like sum, uh, count, uh, final, group by, etc. Uh, so now, as long as your class implements iterable and provides a custom iterator to iterate over elements, uh, you can use uh, the usual uh, methods without having to call iterator first or to list or etc. So it's a, it's a shortcut. Uh, we have uh, a new field, a new parameter uh, for the attributable transformation. 
which uh, allows you to uh, copy uh, an existing immutable install. So here I've got a John Doe uh, user, and then I'm going to copy it, create a new user, uh, but with, for example, just the uh, email uh, which is changed. So that's what I'm doing here, copy with. And then I can check that the name, that's still a John Doe, but the email is the new email address. So immutables, you know, you cannot update uh, an immutable. So you have to create a new uh, immutable. And uh, that way you can uh, uh, copy uh, very easily and just change potentially what needs to be changed. OK? Uh, what do we have? Yeah, some uh, methods for setting. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I, I changed the date here, but forgot to change the, the import. Let me fix that very quickly. Up. March. Uh, so let's say I create a new date, and I want to set the date to be uh, the day of uh, today. So I can do that with uh, set which is mutating. And I can also create a new date with copy with and change a bit like uh, what you saw uh, uh, previously for immutable. Uh, and create a new uh, date uh, similar to the previous one, but with the year changed. So here it's mutating the existing date. And here uh, it's creating a new one. And so that's for dates, and you, you have the same thing for instances, uh, calendar, sorry, in, well, calendar instances, uh, and up copy with, and this is cloning and mutating uh, the, the date afterwards. Okay. Everything fine so far? Okay. Uh, you can loop between date and calendar date points. So if you have two uh, time uh, points, today and next week, you can do today up to next week. And you're going to print all the dates between uh, today and next week. Yeah, there's up to and there's also down to. And similarly for uh, calendar, you can say, okay, from down to to. You're going to uh, do that backwards. Some further improvements on the, the, groovy, sh uh, the groovy shell uh, tool. So for example, if you do uh, uh, and some type, you're going to launch uh, a web browser with uh, the Javadoc page of uh, Java UT Forest and uh, the GDK uh, page because you want to see the methods added by Groovy. You also have tab completions. For example, if I type import Groovy, uh, it's going to suggest, okay, Groovy or Groovy X. Uh, if I tap Groovy dot, JSON dot, and I hit tab, it's going to suggest, okay, which uh, class you want to import. <coughs> <coughs> And for example, if you have a, a variable s, which is a string, if you type s dot uh, two up, it's going to suggest two uppercase. It's going actually to suggest two methods because there's a two uppercase taking no argument, and there's also a two uppercase taking a local uh, argument. So you've got some uh, tab completion, a bit like in an ID. The, uh, when you use grab, uh, by default, we used to uh, fetch the, uh, uh, the dependencies from Maven Central directly, but now we go through uh, bin tray J Center, uh, which is usually uh, much faster uh, than Maven Central. And it also proxies with Maven Central, so in case uh, there's not a dependency uh, in uh, bin tray, it's going to be fetched from Central, put in cache. And it's got some other uh, uh, nice aspects, like uh, in Maven Central, sometimes you've got uh, buggy uh, checksums and things like that. So it's, uh, it's uh, faster uh, for grabbing your dependencies. And now let's move on to Groovy 2.3. So the idea is to uh, get Groovy 2.3 uh, 
in a month or so, so that can be also included in Grails 2.4. Uh, so we are going to, although we haven't yet released a beta or, a, or RC or anything there, uh, there yet, uh, it's pretty much uh, complete what we have in the GitHub currently. So we are going to try to ship uh, GUI 2.3 pretty fast. So first of all, uh, very briefly, and I don't give precise number because uh, we need to uh, uh, do a proper uh, benchmark, but uh, we, we've received some contributions to improve the JSON support. So now when you do use the JSON builder, when you use the, uh, the, uh, the JSON output uh, to also produce uh, uh, the JSON Builder and uh, the uh, what's it? So, uh, JSON Slurper to parse uh, JSON. Uh, it's now very, very fast, and it's consistently faster than uh, JSON or Jackson. So you don't need to use Jackson anymore. In, uh, for example, in the Grails app, you can just use the, uh, the JSON support from GUI. It will be uh, much faster than anything else currently <laughs> available. We have a new uh, template engine. Uh, so this is a very small example here, but uh, uh, it's got quite a few uh, interesting characteristics. So for example, this uh, is going to create, so, it, so it's like the markup builder, if you will, but it's, uh, but it's a template. Uh, so you've got the usual uh, markup builder syntax, but you also have some additional things like template, you can include templates and then you can make the template and uh, output that. And uh, there are many interesting things. First of all, it's a very, very fast uh, template engine. You know, it's uh, byte com compiled. You can have time-checked models. So if you want uh, to uh, check that the, uh, the variables, the, uh, the parameters that you pass to the template are uh, on the correct type, uh, you want to get uh, compilation errors and that kind of things, uh, you can do that. Uh, you've got uh, internationalization support and uh, many more things. So it's a pretty uh, interesting new template engine, especially for not only, but uh, it's nice for uh, HTML, XML, etc. cetera. Uh, traits. So we have uh, traits coming up. So excuse me for a second. It's not very elegant, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, so we are adding traits uh, to Groovy. So traits uh, are a bit like our old uh, mixins, but better and less buggy. Uh, and ultimately it will replace at mixing because at mixing is really a, a pain to support and uh, full of bugs and is only working runtime, but we wanted to have something like mixing, uh, but better, uh, and which also works uh, at compile time. So let's say I'm creating a trait with some yeah, yeah, a flying uh, ability with a fly method. And notice that uh, we introduce a new keyword. That's uh, the first time uh, in a very, very long time that we introduce a new keyword. And it's actually calling the uh, at trait transformation under the hood. Then you have a, a car, for example, and you want to implement that trait. So you say car implements the trait. And then you can say up uh, c equal new car, c dot fly. And you check that uh, it calls the, the fly method from the, the trait. <coughs> 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 the trait we've implemented. Uh, in terms of characteristics, so traits are also stateful, and I have some examples of that afterwards. Uh, so it's unlike Java 8 uh, default methods on uh, interfaces, uh, because you cannot have a state there. Uh, in terms of precedence, when you implement several traits, so you show, uh, I showed just one trait, but what's interesting is that You'll be uh, you'll be able to implement uh, ah, sh ah. you'll be able to uh, implement several traits. So that's a bit like multiple inheritance, if you will. And if you implement uh, two uh, traits, 
the uh, like the question earlier about uh, delegation. The the first declared uh, trait wins if there's the same method with the uh, same signature in both traits. Uh, and <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, if uh, the class uh, that's the class which uh, takes precedence. And we also have a uh, runtime mixing with reusing the ASCII keyword, and I'm going to show that. So for statefulness, uh, let's say you have a, a trait uh, called named with a name uh, property, and uh, I want uh, my phone class to implement that trait. Uh, so you can you see that here I can call the, the usual map-based constructor, and it's going to uh, put Galaxy S3 in the, in the name uh, property here, and I can check that it's got the correct value. So that's stateful. So the, the usual uh, GUI property notation, but you can also create your own getters and setters and so on, if, of course. Uh, we also have inheritance. Uh, so here I have, again, my named uh, trait. And I have a name-speakable uh, trait, which uh, extends, actually, that uh, named uh, trait, and which adds a uh, speak method, and which co uh, reuses the, the name property from that one. And then my phone, oh, uh, another error here. Oh, sorry, speakable. And here I implement that new trait, and you can see that, okay, phone speak, my name is Galaxy A3. So that's trait inheritance. So traits can inherit from uh, uh, all the traits. And another one, this is the for runtime traits. So uh, before, in my examples, uh, in my examples here, uh, I had define a new class, class phone implements, blah, blah, blah. But here, uh, I already have a, an existing class, but perhaps from elsewhere, and I want to uh, implement the, uh, the flying trait, uh, but for that instance, I want to make that duck instance uh, to be able to fly, okay? So I'm, say, I'm saying new duck as flying, and then it returns some kind of proxy over uh, a flying interface. Uh, and it's of type flying, and it's got the fly uh, method. So it's a runtime trait because you do it uh, at runtime and not uh, creating a new class implementing the trait. Okay? <coughs> <coughs> We have a, an, another um, transformation coming up, which is tail recursive. So the JVM doesn't support tail recursion, but for uh, methods uh, which are uh, tail recursive, which are calling uh, themselves recursively, and that's the last step of uh, the algorithm is uh, doing the self-call. Uh, uh, so uh, it's going to uh, stack uh, all the calls instead of uh, going uh, deep in the uh, uh, stack frames. So it's tail recursion. So it was uh, contributed by Johannes Link, and it's been uh, added to, uh, uh, to our sources now. And uh, it can be applied to methods and not closures. For closures, we already have uh, the trampoline method, which you can use for that purpose. Something we're working on, uh, a new website, new documentation. And uh, the new documentation is being written in ASCII doctor, in ASCII doc format. Uh, so it takes a long time to write that documentation, but if you want to uh, help with writing some documentation, please don't hesitate. We would most welcome any help writing uh, some new content. 
And uh, so these are uh, some uh, mockups uh, of what, what the, the future websites and documentation will look like. And uh, you can also see the, the Groovy web console there, which will also receive a facelift. And we're looking for contribution. Uh, and another thing uh, that we are working on uh, that Cedric studied uh, just a, a couple of days ago, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, a new uh, template uh, and style uh, for uh, Groovy Doc. So instead of that unsexy uh, old Groovy Doc, we're going to have something like that, which hopefully is a bit nicer. So ideally, we should try to make that work as well for uh, the, the, the GDK uh, documentation to reuse the same style sheets so, so as to have some coherent uh, look and feel for uh, the new documentation, APIs, and so on. Uh, something we might be adding uh, later on that we haven't added. Uh, so when I mentioned the implicit closure coercion from Groovy 2.2, uh, when you have two atomic methods with which takes two parameters. When you call atomic closure, uh, you pass a closure, and you expect that closure to be coerced to either atomic, uh, either action or either parameterized action. Currently, the Groovy compiler would complain and say, I don't know which one you really want to call. So usually, you have to use as explicitly, as action, as parameterized action. But something we might be uh, doing later on is uh, disambiguating uh, according to the types uh, and the, the parameters and types of those parameters uh, of the of the closure. So it's something. So far, we haven't received any request for that, but that's an enhancement we might be doing. And I'll finish quickly on Groovy three. So we've been speaking of uh, the MOP to the new meta object protocol for many many years. I think we started speaking uh, about that uh, in two thousand and six or seven. So it's been uh, taking a while. So the usual suspects, the new MOP for a new age. Uh, we want the new runtime heart of Groovy to be based on uh, the Invoke Dynamic uh, support to get uh, some good performance uh, without reusing our usual call side caching technique and so on. Uh, we also want to take a chance uh, to rationalize uh, the way you're doing meta programming. Uh, because uh, over the years we added many different ways of doing meta runtime meta programming, so we want to try to homogenize uh, that. Uh, we also have this idea of uh, creating a realm. A realm, it's a it's a way of saying, uh, okay, in this part of my code base, uh, I want to be able. I, I don't want to be impacted by someone hacking on string or whatever. Uh, so I want to be safe in that uh, realm. So we're trying to uh, uh, do something there, and uh, also of trying to find a way to uh, uh, find a solution for the private visibility uh, problem. So we, uh, at the, the last uh, Groovy uh, DevCon uh, meeting, we even uh, discussed a new operator to allow uh, private access. So instead of uh, allowing access to private stuff by default, it would be disallowed, and you'd have to use a special uh, notation. Uh, and I don't remember what we had, uh, like dot. Uh, uh, I don't remember what we ended up finding. Well, dot something, another weird character, uh, and it would be a private call potentially. So we are going to try to tackle that. We are also uh, we are also going to uh, rewrite the, the Groovy grammar. Uh, currently, we use uh, the old Antler uh, library, uh, the version two, but the latest one is version four. And uh, the Groovy grammar evolved from a Java grammar, but it, it's really become uh, more and more painful to uh, evolve the grammar when we need to do uh, some some uh, tweaks. So we'll try to do that. And uh, we also we, we will also have to uh, implement the, the Java 8 constructs like default interfaces, uh, etc. Uh, default methods, sorry, uh, in the interfaces. And we have a, a Google Summer of Code who's going to help us uh, work on that, hopefully. 
So the Java 8 support. So that's basically it. Uh, Groovy has been rocking the JVM since 2003 and keeps on rocking it, hopefully. And uh, I'm happy. Uh, so first of all, thanks for your attention.